guys welcome back to the podcast you are listening to let it out hosted by me my name is katie delbout thank you so much for listening to this podcast every week i talk to inspiring fascinating people that i want to get to know more and i do so live on the air for us all to hear together and hopefully learn something feel less alone laugh smile hopefully all of the above and today's episode is all of those things. I think you will do all of those things. I love Latham Thomas and her coming back on the show was a big moment for me and I talk about that in this episode but she was one of the first people to say yes to doing my podcast back when I started it in early 2013 when nobody knew what podcasts were pre-serial, you know, I don't think people even really knew what podcasts were and I had one and she said yes and I was so happy because I looked up to her and then here I am a couple years later in her home hanging out with her and it was just such a lovely Saturday morning that we spent together. We talk about appreciation of beauty, motherhood, feminism in the best way I've heard someone talk about and define their feminism. She has a model of feminism which is based on embracing and being a woman and the balance of men and women in life and it's just really great how she explains it. She gives advice about non-attachment and finding community and supporting other women and She's just a beautiful person. I've said that word too much, but that's all I can think of when I think of Latham Thomas. Her home is beautiful. She's beautiful looking. She's beautiful in the way she speaks. She's so articulate. I loved this episode. We talk about how balance is a myth, spirituality, and I think you're going to love this episode. All right, before we get into it, let's talk about our sponsor. So Latham has beautiful skin, and therefore I know she would love Franklin and Whitman or Frankenwit, as they are lovingly referred to, are my favorite beauty products. And I think each week that they're a sponsor, I'm going to talk about a different product that I really love. But if you listened to the podcast last week, you know all about them and how they were started. It's actually my friend Chris's company, and I genuinely love the products. This week, I'm really loving the hair serum. It is these really beautiful, (laughs) there's that word again, essential oils that make my hair soft and strong. And I put it at the ends. I don't put it at the root uh, at all because I think that might make it greasy. Not that my hair ever really gets greasy, but I think just putting it at the ends works really well for me. I think you guys would like it too. They also have amazing face masks. That's what they're known for. They use superfoods in their face masks like cacao and matcha and turmeric. And they're wonderful. I love them. And I also love their cleansing oil. Everything. It's the it's top notch. It's organic. It's cruelty free. And they give 5% of all of the sales to animal shelters. So they're great. Everything is vegan and really great for your skin. So thank you so much to Frank and Wit for sponsoring. And if you want to check them out, you can get 20% off your order by using Katie, that's my name, K-A-T-I-E, at checkout. So, Latham has beautiful skin. Chris, if you're listening, we've got to get Latham a a package of Franklin and Whitman. All right, Latham also has a book coming out. And I think you guys should all check out her book because, well, after this episode, you'll just hear. She's fantastic and I just love her so much. One more sponsor I'm going to tell you about before we get into the episode with Latham. Freshbooks.com. If you are like Latham, an entrepreneur, and you're juggling a million things, maybe you're also a mom like Latham, finances might be the last thing to remember. It might really go down low on the list. And if that's the case, 
FreshBooks is what you need. It's the easy to use online cloud accounting software that will keep you organized, make you look like a boss. You can send invoices with it. You can bill your clients and look really legit. You can change your colors and your logo, which I know as a Taurus, someone who appreciates beauty, like Latham taught me, we're both Tauruses. We appreciate beauty a lot and FreshBooks does too. So FreshBooks must also be a Taurus. Who knows? Anyway, they're a great online cloud accounting software and you can try them for free for 30 days by using the code let it out at checkout that's a free unrestricted 30-day trial thank you so much freshbooks thank you freaking wit thank you for listening if you like this podcast give it a rating a review if you will on itunes share it with a friend share it with someone that you think will enjoy it i hope you have a great time listening to this episode and I'll talk to you at the end with the emoji and just you know some more chatting thank you so much for doing this I um it's just such a full circle moment for me because I had just started my I wrote this down in my notes because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to tell you but I just started my podcast I'll never forget it I was on an airplane to New York actually no and I checked my phone because I remember I sent an email to like info at mama go that I just like stalked <laughs> on your website and you responded to me like somewhat quickly and I was on the plane on the way to New York to Gabby's talk with Hay House where I won my book deal oh my and gosh. I was on the plane and you were, were the first guest ever to respond to me that I reached out to Aww. and I had I, I like made this whole I think the subject on was like promotional opportunity podcast but like I don't even remember what you said I made it seem like I already had a podcast and I did I maybe had like one episode with my health coach but like that was it and you were so kind to me and it gave me the confidence to keep doing this podcast and now I'm almost at 200 episodes it's four years later that's crazy now I live in New York and your second book is coming out and I'm at your house yay I'm so excited it's awesome Wow, I didn't know that. I love that story. Yeah, so thank you for saying yes, because this podcast is happening because of you, basically. (sighs) Well, that's a lot of accolades, (laughs) but I really think that it's because of you and because you knew that you had something to say and people that you needed to reach. And also, I think that, you know, so many of us are like in this realm you know, knowing each other and, you know what I mean, and um, interacting, but not necessarily like you know, having these conversations where you're like, um, I am like one degree away from this person and they get interviewed all the time, but there's things that I want to ask them that I want to bring out that they never probably get asked. And so I think it's awesome when I get to, um, be in different spaces that are, you know what I mean? Where I can talk about stuff that I'm not always, you know, asked about, or also I really believe in, lifting women and supporting women and so when someone's like hey i have this thing that i'm doing and like you know you're like making me feel inspired or your you know your work did this or whatever it is um i feel like it's important for us to like co-sign and say i believe in you also and um and whether or not you know i've said yes to a whole bunch of things some of them have like blossomed into um, the stratosphere and other things that I've never heard of ever again. But I think that it's important to um, to show people that you also can invest in what they're doing. And, um, and it helps because sometimes if someone says yes to me and then other people that I really, that are really hard to reach see that like other people have supported then they're like more inclined to say yes you know because they're like well i don't know you but this person believes in you and i believe in them so i'm gonna just take a, a chance and so we have to do that with each other and i think um we have to also support things that even if it's not like you said you only had one podcast even if it if it's like you only have a certain number or whatever if it's like oh well it's not really at whatever place that um that would be so called quote unquote beneficial like you have to look at it like you're planting seeds and investing in other people not just that you know you should do things that only benefit you i think we have to do things 
to show that we're part of a continuum of supporting each other and lifting each other. And um, so also because people pour into you, you know, in your own life, so you need to also pour into others. And so I think that that's like part of what we're supposed to be doing. So I was so grateful to be a part of your podcast. (laughs) Well, it's really, it's really great because first of all, this is my favorite thing I've ever done Mm -hmm. because connection is I think what we're lacking in our society and our culture right now Mm -hmm. and I feel like this is so great because how often do we get to have a long-form conversation where like our phones are off we're just connecting Mm -hmm. to people and I really think podcasting is the new networking and when I started that podcast you and Gabby and all of these great women that I looked up to so much said yes to me and then, you know, at that point, I, it was pre-serial. It was before, like, anyone knew what podcasts were, really. And now that you're in my archive, and I was just looking, and that episode with you and I from four years ago is still, because I was preparing my notes for today, it's still the second highest episode that you've ever done. And because people still go back and listen to it, mm. like, yesterday, somebody That's listened crazy. to that episode from four years ago. That's and I had no idea what we said. I didn't listen to it. I don't either. But, <laughs> I mean, I think, hopefully, whoever listens to that also listens to this one. It can yes. see how far I've come as a host, hopefully. Oh, my God, um, I love it. But anyway, my point is, it's it, you're part of, like, this archive, and I'm just so grateful and Aww. supporting other women, and especially with you, because I, I said this last time, but I've always felt very connected to you, because, mm. maybe because we're both Tauruses, yes. or, I don't know what it is, but every time you speak, it just kind of goes right in, like, it just, like, whoop, like, goes right into me, so, anyway. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm getting a picture of you, too. Yay. <laughs> um, okay, so lately, before we get into your book and everything you've done in the last four years, I and I'm eager to talk about that for sure, but I've been loving starting this podcast in the present. Mm-hmm. So what have you been contemplating, realizing, thinking about, or learning very recently, like in the last day or week what we've been contemplating in the past week yeah or even today Um, like what's been on your mind well I'm having um I'm coming off of a birth this week and um I'm coming off of a birth I'm coming off of a lot of um planning a birth as a doula as a doula delivering I, I just had my last baby of the summer and it was a beautiful birth and a beautiful experience to end my um, my season of deliveries because um, in the fall I'll be touring and doing a lot of stuff with the book so it won't be the same I won't have the same availability to attend births um, until next year how many do you usually have at a time um it depends like uh, you know, up to two to three a month, but um, I scaled back on doing that many. So usually it's just like one a month, you know, for me personally. And then we have doulas who will take on other births and we hope to, I shouldn't say hope, but we will expand our leadership in terms of doulas and um, yoga teachers to service women all over the country in the next year yeah so so doing a lot of work with that with planning and um I think something that's so important that has been a constant focus of mine and definitely in the past week but just in general has been um around this idea of um of preparation and planning and not like planning in terms of trying to make sure that everything happens a certain way but more like um making a map of like kind of where you want to go and what and how we get there I think is um sort of like up to God but I do think that you know mapping out like where you're headed um is really important and so business wise I just have to do that and my favorite part is like you know, design and aesthetic and languaging and programming and all these really beautiful aspects of how we share our message with the world. And my least favorite part is 
actually sitting at the whiteboard and like mapping out and scheduling and you know but I've had to spend some time doing that so that I can ensure that we succeed in our in our mission and so um in while we're also building you know like the framework for um service that'll really support moms in the way that we see for the future because I think another thing is um, and this happens, as you know, when you write a book, like you're writing about something um, this year that's going to come out next year or whatever. Yeah. And then the things that you wrote about, maybe your viewpoints have evolved or the way you language it evolves. And so when you're building something, you have to build for you have to be in the present within with a, a, a vision and um, focal point in your mind's eye for the future. And I think that the same when, you know, like when I wrote this last book, I spent tons of time, you know, like not writing and tons of time, you know, writing and then going away and then coming back to it and reading and then changing and morphing. And and um, I think till the very end, when I turned it in, I had um, made some edits. And so, I think it's important for us to constantly be in a space of, um, of editing, of peeling yeah. back and shaving away and, and, and planning and, and seeing like how that process, which I believe we need to put more focus on process rather than just outcome and product and, and what something appears like, but what something really is. And so that's really been, I think, a focus for me is um, just like you know, diving deep into that. Um, and, um, and that spans so many of our endeavors, whether it's Mama Glow, we have this beauty line coming also for winter, which is so beautiful. All of these things are happening at once and I have to keep my eye on everything. Um, but I also have to know like kind of what's around the corner, which is also very interesting, so. You, you mentioned design and aesthetics mm -hmm. and that that's kind of your favorite part. And oh, I know, my very favorite. <laughs> I know at Columbia you say environmental science, but also design, right? Visual arts. Visual arts. Yeah. So how do you kind of bleed that? I mean, that we're sitting in your beautiful space Aww. and everything you have on your, from your Instagram to, you know, the products that you put out with your books are always so well designed. How do you really like bleed that into your life well I believe um, I believe that a life well lived is beautiful and so I seek to bring beauty into everything that I do um, I mean as a Taurus you know like we're ruled by Venus it's everything is about beauty and opulence and and an experience and how something feels just as much as how something looks and so um, when I think about how I want a woman to feel, you know, whether she's in her birth or whether she's in a yoga class with me or whether she's, you know, um, reading a book that I wrote, I'm considering the feeling, right? With word choice, with design, with font, with like everything. So, because I know that um, there are impediments to people receiving what you have to give if it's not packaged right. It's like, you know, um, if you think about, I'm trying to think of an example, but, you know, there are certain things like um, if you, oh, perfect examples like this. So if you went to like um, a, a market and there is a particular, you know, there's salt, right? It's just here it's in a little bag or whatever. And then you see some salt and it's like in this beautiful jar and it's branded. You're like, oh, well, I, I want that salt. Right. It's salt. Right. Yeah. It's like probably the same, you know, in terms. I mean, obviously there's different types of salt, but like in that particular jar, so it's the same salt. You're going to choose the more beautiful yeah. one. At least to us tourists. We yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, and somebody might be like, oh, well, whatever. Like, say it's the same price. You're going to choose a thing that presents yeah. better. And so... I think because we seek things that are beautiful, we seek things that remind us that um, that life is beautiful, that like 
you know, it's full, like texture and beauty. And like, we have to, I think, embed this into our lives. And so for me, it's like, it's in everything. Like my office is really beautiful and cozy. I try to make my house that way. Um, I want to make the birth experience that way for women. And I also want for anyone who comes into anything that we do to feel um, a sense of safety, security, and um, belonging. And we have to create spaces that are cozy and that are beautiful, that evoke that energy like, oh, okay, I'm safe here. I can relax. Like you said, I'm getting comfortable here because yeah. you feel welcome. If yeah. it was a different environment, you might not feel that way. Right. You might be like, okay, well, should I sit down? Or, yeah. you know, you, you might really not have felt, that. right? Yeah. So I think that that's a, a energy and that I take really seriously. And not everybody does. And not everyone has to. Some people, that's not their focus. It's also not their what part of what their mission on the planet is so that's okay but i think for for us in particular who really are are here to um i think be conduits of aesthetic you know and help people to come to know beauty and the grace that exists around us is through you know us showing like through instagram or through our website experience or through a service whatever like that you deserve this you know and this is and I created this for you yeah so you came to New York to go to Columbia yes did you know that you wanted to live in New York when you, you grew up in California I grew up in California in the last episode I remember yes and then you went to boarding school in Colorado right? I sure did <laughs> I gave the commencement speech in my boarding school this year in May which is oh, awesome really? by the way yes so cool. It was bizarre what to was be back there. What was that experience like? It was weird because I was, I think I was last there like 20 years ago or something. So or you hadn't been back since you graduated. I had not. So it was weird because I was like, um, I think it was last year 20 years ago. Like this is so weird. And um, things felt very similar. I could, I recalled certain emotions and experiences and I could remember things there were some people like teachers as well as staff who were still there wow. it was really bizarre but um i remember um i remember feeling that experience was amazing and um coming i guess from colorado starting in california and then moving out to new york i knew that i needed to be here i didn't know if i was going to stay and it became more apparent, like, where will I go? Um, that became more of a question that I started to ask once I was a senior. And I realized, like, I just felt really comfortable. I wanted to stay. And it wasn't a plan. No, in New York. Oh, actually. Yeah, yeah, once yeah. I got here. And so I didn't know um, that I would stay, but it, it just kind of, it's like life just kept leading me here and I enjoy my youth here like I I had my entire adult life in New York so and I think most of my life period that I've lived has been in New York because I was 14 when I went to boarding school for four years and then from 18 to or yes yeah, so for 14 to 18 in Colorado and then from 18 to now in New York so I've been my entire most of my life here and definitely my entire adult life so I do feel like it's a place that eventually like if my son decides he's gonna to go to college someplace else I might just go move to be with him or closer to him but um, I don't see myself leaving super soon yeah. I, I really enjoy um, there's something about New York there's a lot of things that are challenging and I was at um, Dave Chappelle the other day and he said something hilarious like how do people live here without having like their own TV show? <laughs> and he was like, you know, it's like people struggle to yeah. live here. And like, but the great thing about that struggle or the idea of, you know, perseverance or uprising is I think back to like, you know, my upbringing around plants and plant systems and, and, and studying botany. And when you walk down the street in New York, and you see these plants that are growing through concrete, like that is what 
you become like you become that resilient when you live in a place like this because it's a tough city so you are the and when you see those plants growing through sometimes you see the concrete is actually like mangled from the root systems that are pushing up and and letting these plants come through and those plants that grow in the harshest of circumstances have the most volatile oils, which means that the medicine and the potency that lives in those plants is transferred into whoever eats that plant. Wow. Um, and it's the most potent versus a plant that's like in a cushy environment of very fertile and forgiving soil. So that's those plants analogy. are actually more powerful, like the one, the weeds. Yeah. So if we think about ourselves like in these spaces, I think that a place like New York, Detroit, like all these places that are like... We're like the plants. Yes. We're like the plants because we're we're coming up in these places that are more harsh in terms of what they give you. And if you can come on the other side of that and deliver something beautiful and also maintain like your your core essence and and use all these tools that's why it's so important to have mindfulness tools and self-care because there's no other way to live in a city like this unless you have those practices on lock um then you can really thrive you know you can live anywhere also by the way if you've lived in a situation like what new york presents to you where it's super hard to get an apartment like you said it's super challenging to just like i mean just think about going to the grocery store it's like a freaking fiasco just to get yeah. a bag of groceries. If you think about it, in any other place, you drive up, yeah. your car is like 50 right feet there. from the door, you go in, you get your groceries, there's carts that are, and there's shopping aisles that there's are big less enough people. for people to actually be in the shopping aisle yeah. together and not create congestion. And then you go out with your groceries, which costs a fraction of the amount, you put them in your car, you drive off. New York. Like you go to the grocery, There's then that you're schlepping. Weird, like thing at Whole Foods that I was unfamiliar with. with the oh, lines. the line. There's a whole I, line thing. I had no idea. Oh no, there's a whole confused. line thing, which I is was crazy. Shamed. <laughs> yeah, they're like, go, it's your turn. Yeah. yeah. No, you're in line. Like it's a competition, <laughs> right? And everybody's like, you know, ready is to it go. Is my number? Now I'm like very diligent about paying. No, you gotta pay super close attention. And if you don't go right away, people are on your tail. Yep. And then you get the groceries and you walk out and it's like, am I taking the subway with this? Am I taking a cab? Am I getting it delivered? Am I schlepping up my stair? It's like, it's a lot. You have to make life decisions just to go get groceries. So there's so many, and that's like just one of the tiny things. There's so many challenges around laundry. There's so many challenges around living here. And so I think that you have to like, you have to have these practices that help you to maintain optimal well-being in a place that creates a lot of opportunity for existential stress to pop up at any moment. Um, But also a place that presents the most um, challenging opportunity for you to dive dive deep into um, exploration and cultivation and creation like you can people here create the most amazing things because also because of that pressure I believe yeah so it's one of those places where I do feel an affinity for do you have a favorite New York moment hmm like something that happened while I was here yeah or even just like a, a tough thing that you like overcame when you were younger when you were when you first got here or even recently or just like a very like new york moment um like i had this synchronistic thing happen the other day i was about to interview ruby like i mentioned and the next day and we're just walking across the williamsburg bridge and i see her no way yeah so yeah that like i love like that. that like yeah i feel like i've had many of those even already yeah i feel like there's so many moments of synchronicity that happen here. I can't remember just one, but I will say that, um, like living here, when people say like, how do you make friends or how do you connect with people? I feel like it's very easy to meet people and very easy to connect because of how you move through the city using the trains and walking and stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think of like a particular moment that's been like whoa yeah, it's for hard me. Yeah, put on the spot. It is hard to think of that. Well, if you think of something. Yeah. 
Well, you mentioned something I, I wrote down in my notes that I wanted to ask you, which was about community and as yes. a transplant here, but mostly everyone is a transplant here. I feel like you have this beautiful community of women and yes. friends. How did you grow that and, and what advice do you have for growing that? That's a great um, question and actually that spawned a really cool um, New York moment. So, Perfect. which will be answering both. Perfect. Um, so I um, met, I think like when you're here and you're exposed to culture and people and, and stuff that's happening, you're just like in that nexus of like whatever the zeitgeist is that we're living. Um, I met a lot of really cool people that were on the precipice when we were younger. So like they were just about to be like the most amazing Broadway star or just about to, you know, like just at the edge. And so, and now I know these people who are like Tony Award winning and Grammy Award winning and whatever, but we were all kind of at the time just coming up together and just doing our thing. And so, um, one example of just like the friendship is that I, um, you know, as I know so many women, um, it seems that I like rotate in terms of, you know, some people pop into my mind and I know that I need to give attention. It's like, suddenly I'm like, wait a minute, how's this one doing or that one doing? And then I, you know what I mean? And then I reach out and then I'm like, hey, I need to see you, come over, whatever. So um, I I have people like that and there's a sister friend who I love named um, Sarah Jones and she's a Tony Award winning playwright. Um, She's won Obie Awards. I mean, she's amazing. And uh, she... um, she and I were like running mates and we would just, cause she lives on the West side too. So we like, okay. And that's also too, like a lot of your friends are like geographically located because it's just easier. Yeah. So she was on the West side. I was on the West side. So we do like runs together or just go for walks or have breakfast together and like politic and these kind of things. Anyway. So she, um, she and I were talking and it has just so happened that I had gotten back like maybe a week or two before from um, this Super Soul 100 um, brunch that Oprah had had for a bunch of us that were a part of this Just casually gossiping group over. that she <laughs> put together. And so one of the people who was there was India Irie. And so we had met kind of for the first time then. And um, she said later, she's like, I was in such a bad mood that day. And you were so nice. And I was like, you were? I didn't even notice. I was like, I noticed that you were like, like less talkative, but I didn't know you were in a bad mood. She's like, girl, I was in such a bad mood. But long story short, like we had connected then. And then all of a sudden I get this random text and I'm like, who is this? And she was like, it's India. And I was like, how'd you get my number? And she's like, oh, our friend Sarah. So the friend who I always run with, she was like, you know, it was crazy because your name came up from three different people in New York all within a few days and I was like I gotta reach out to this girl and I also gotta tell her that I was in a really bad mood when we met Uh and and so um she's like so we should hang out I was like definitely and I was like where are you located and she was like on the west side I was like what I'm on the west side and so then she came down and she sat here and we you know I had made dinner I pulled all these greens from like this roof downtown that my friend has and we had this amazing salad and we stayed up to like four in the morning And it was crazy because she just like drove down like that, like in our texting, it was like, yo, I'm free. You're free. I'm free. Okay, boom. And then we just started hanging out. And it was like the beginning of like an amazing friendship that we have now. But it was like so wild because that would only happen in New York where you're like, oh, what are you doing right now? Um, you know, it's, and it was late already. It wasn't even like, it was like six o'clock in the evening. Like, let's go do something. It was already like eight or something. And we were like, let's kick it. And then we ended up staying up till super late, just like girls, oh, you know, so fun. but it was also because like all of these people, everybody like ends up knowing each other yeah. and you kind of, and there's also this like really interesting thing in New York, I feel where it's like your guard is down when you're because you have people who are also vetting people so it's like if i say oh you got to meet such and such you're not going to be like oh i don't know you're gonna be like cool like i want to meet them because i trust you and you're saying that person's cool and it's like i think there's a this perception that people are mean or have bad attitudes here and it's just not true i think that you do see people who are like definitely like that 
And that's like what the typical stereotype of like a New Yorker is. But what I know to be New Yorkers are people who are immensely um, connected and, and well-resourced and who are really all like interested in seeing everyone else succeed. And so we're all like, yo, uh, you need to know my friend Katie or you need to know this person. Like we're all like that, which I think is um, really what makes New York such an interesting place because if you have a goal to like, for you, if you have a goal to interview a certain person, like in New York, you're gonna probably run into them at some point. Mm -hmm. Like it's just an interesting place where like things just happen. And, um, and I feel like in other places, you know, it's not the same, there's not that same kind of like energy. Yeah. And so people come here because of that energy, not just because they want to succeed or not just because they want to be on Broadway or not just because, you know, they come for a good job. People come here because there's like magic in New York. Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's like a, one of the things that was, you know, that was definitely my New York moment, but also a, a way that I've cultivated friendship is just like, you know, all of us kind of, you know, s supporting each other and keeping our tentacles in each other's lives. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's times when like friends are super busy and I'm like, oh, they're doing this or touring or whatever it is happening in their lives, but still keeping a constant ebb and flow of connection, even if you don't get to see right. people every day. Because yeah. there's people who live here who I feel like I see them more when they're like in LA. And it's like, yeah. oh, I'm also in LA, let's get together. It's like, how can we don't hang out when we're home? Yeah. But there is like a responsibility, I think, that you have to, to friendship to to cultivate it here you know yeah. in a different way because people are so busy yeah yeah i love what you said about when you think of someone popping into your head taking that as a sign to reach out oh yeah and i find that as well i have to go back and ask you about oprah and <sighs> what that experience was like and mm. first of all congratulations oh my God, so well you. deserved Aww. what was that experience like and you got to meet her right yes i love her um, everything she seems to be. Oh, she's everything that she, that you feel, that you would think, Ugh. like she is everything. Um, yeah, you know, I was very surprised because, you know, my work is really, um, for, you know, the past over a decade has been dedicated to women's health, particularly, um, along the childbearing continuum. And, um, I just wasn't expecting that, you know... Oprah would take notice and approve of, you know, the work that I've done. And so I was so excited. I printed out the letter, I remember, and I was like, and her signature was on it. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, it was like just really beautiful, especially as a girl who grew up watching her, yeah. you know, with my mother and my grandmother. It felt really gratifying. And then um, after that, uh, you know, going to meet her and meet all the other like honorees was amazing. Um, she did a brunch for us, which was awesome, and and uh, made a friend. Yeah, so it was just like so great. Yeah. And then I've been able to since work with them on content. Like we created a, vid a video series together, which is like slowly rolling out on own and on um, cool. social and stuff. And my dad was like, you know, he said we were um, fast forwarding on um, our DVR or whatever. And my, my stepmother looks up and she's like, wait a minute, I think that's Danny. They call me Danny because my middle name is Danielle. She's like, wait, wait a minute, I think it's Danny. And he's like, wait, what? And they turn back, they're like, oh my God. And they're sort of like, we were watching you, we had no idea. And I was like, well, I told you, but I get it, you know. <laughs> so um, so it, that's been really cool too because it's like when you, I would never have guessed that looking back, that that would be where, you know, that I would have been able to do that. I was so honored, obviously. Yeah. And so, um, so it's been such a such a blessing, and obviously it helps to open doors and it helps to solidify, um, you know, uh, support it from other people when they see like, oh, there's that connection. So um, I'm just grateful for that. But also, I think it just um, helps other people feel inspired to continue their journeys because I know that it's a challenge, you know, for for all of us to be doing what it is that we do and um, and to have. Uh, the um the support of like we were talking about in the beginning like when someone's like co-signing or lifting you up yeah. then it just helps it just it really helps to it doesn't mean that i don't continue to do the work or it doesn't mean that now i think like you know i've arrived someplace it means that you continue the, the work but i think that the main thing is that 
you know, for people who I talk to a lot, they'll be like, well, I want to get on here. or I want to do this. I'm like, okay, well, what are you doing? Like, what's the purpose and what's the mission and what's the, like, who are you serving? Like, what are you, what's your mission around service? Yeah. You know, what's the intention around service? Making it not about you. Yeah. Or even if it is, but like, do you have, does it have to be about you being on TV? Can like, is TV the vehicle because you have to change the world and people have to see that? Or is it just that you want like for your self worth? Like, and so I think that there's an issue around people being noticed in their regular lives um, for, for who they are and validated in who they are first. And so we see so much of people crying out through social media to be seen and to be heard that they're not doing the work because they're too busy like showing that like, look at me and I have all this stuff going on instead of like, let me actually go and be the health coach. Let me actually go and be the yoga teacher. Let me actually go and be the doula. Like, do that work first. And I think for me, it was like, I was just focused on work. I really was just focused on, like, I'm serving. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that when you do that, like, really, things come, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And having that non-attachment, yes. I think. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I feel like you've had so much success and... But you've also worked so hard and been so genuine in your work. Mm. How does how do you remind yourself of non attachment when it comes to goals? Yeah, I mean, I I map out things that have to get done, and then I map out um, a vision for what I see as the future in in terms of a dream. And in the new book, in On Your Glow, we have a really beautiful um, uh, like exercise and ritual around this process and it's in the very beginning of the book that we go through this it's called glow vision and and there's a a bunch of you know steps that it takes you through um but i see it as like a really important aspect of you know we we can't tell how it's going to happen so like when i when i work with moms um what will happen is someone comes to me and we're talking about the birth i'm like well what is your vision like what would you like to happen what like in an ideal world how would that be and they share with me like their thoughts their their hopes their dreams their goals and all of that their fears too and then we get to like okay cool we can't control we have no idea how the baby decides to come we have no idea what god wants for you um we just know that like the end goal is a healthy mom healthy baby um, and so we map, right? And then on that map, there's all these things that we hope will transpire and that we actually set the intention for, but we don't set the outcome for, right? So we set like the stage for the best outcome possible, but then that's it. And that's all we can do. And so the same with like my work, it's like I set a framework. I have things in mind. I set a framework for it. I'm flexible around how it happens, what it looks like, and and how it becomes. But then I don't say like, okay, by this date, this has to happen. It's more like, I would like to do this. And if it means that we have to move the date from November, because now I feel, you know, constrained around the book launch, that we now put it in January, then that's what we do. And so for me, it's less about... um, it's about like softening and a little bit about um, flexibility and um, and not like putting yourself in the position where you get so locked into doing one thing that now you have to like forgive yourself and go through this whole step of like I did something wrong. It's like no, sometimes like we set out in a certain way and then we had to course correct. Yeah. And so I believe in like um, you know like allowing yourself the space for for change allowing yourself the space for course correction and pivoting and then also not getting like you said so attached that like when you get to a place where you're going to have to make a decision and the decision makes you feel like you failed that now you're like in the spiral that you have to pull yourself up out of you know and, and and really return so um so i think that uh having you know, being committed, but being flexible around how things um, show up and then also giving your best is the best thing you can do. And that's how I operate. So if it looks like on the outside that all these things are going really well, part of that is because 
I'm just, you know, like kind of letting things flow in and, you know, we're managing them and with the larger vision in place and, you know, meeting some of our, you know, um, hitting some of our goals or some of our benchmarks, but always having a larger ultimate vision, a larger ultimate, uh, like, framework for where we're headed so that we know that we're always on course because I think that even if you have a goal and you get super close or you hit it what's after that yeah so it can't just be that okay this is my goal no here is my mission for service here's my mission for like being why I'm on the planet to begin with like and all these things are just almost like stepping stones along the way of fulfilling that agreement you know for why I came here yeah so um so I try to stay you know, flexible around that because things do present. Like sometimes God puts something and you're like, oh shoot, like this, you know, is leading us this direction. And if I would have been so focused or pushing myself this direction to do this particular thing in this particular time frame and in in this particular manner, I would have totally missed the blessing of something else. It's almost like the impetus of Mama Glow because, and maybe you could talk about that just a little bit. I know we got into it in the last episode, but you became pregnant with your son and Mm -hmm. then it spawned this whole beautiful life for you which I know as a kid was always in the in your mind but it was kind of a signal can you talk about that a bit definitely so you know my pregnancy um was yeah the definitely the impetus for starting mama glow and I had like a lot of people will start um start something when they feel um an experience is traumatic or where they feel, um, obviously where they think that the work needs to be done, but sometimes the impetus is because there was a a horrible experience. And I've had so many people who've come that I know of that have come to the space from that lens of, I had, I felt gypped in the process and I want to change that for people. And that's a beautiful place to come from as well. Mine was the opposite. I had an incredible experience, um, a deeply spiritual experience. And I wanted to preserve whatever it is that women want to have available to them in that process. I wanted to make sure that I could help do that and be a vessel for, um, you know, protection and of peace and of handholding in the process for women. Um, I knew that I could be that, and I resisted it for a very long while. You know, as a child, my mother, my grandmother, no, sorry, my mother, my great aunt, and my aunt. We're pregnant at the same time and so I was four years old I was at the height of their bellies so I was just basically hitting bellies all day like with my face and kissing all the bellies and um, I remember my cousin and I would stuff cabbage patch dolls under our shirts and deliver each other's babies so I had already this connection with birth and was deeply uh, you know moved by it um, from like an early age imprinted And so I didn't know, though, that I was going to show up like 20 some odd years later and be like, you know, the be the seed for Mama Glow. Yeah. And it was. And so um, I was open to that, although as a Taurus, you know, we're very great at being stubborn as well. So I was resisting, too. And a lot of us, you know, especially some of us who are listening, will have things that present themselves over and over and over and then we'll be like, uh, and we'll try to rationalize why it's not for us or why it can't be or why we shouldn't do it. But for some reason, it keeps presenting itself. And this was what doula was for me, that um, it kept presenting itself. It kept, kept coming up and people kept asking me to do it. I had these prenatal yoga classes that were like sold out, packed, packed. And people were like, can you deliver my baby? I was like, no. And so I kept fighting that. And then ultimately, I remember I went to an ashram and um, I was actually teaching at this ashram, leading a workshop. And they during the workshop, it was actually my birthday happened while I was there. And so during my birthday, I remember um, they, were, they did a puja for my a ceremony for my birthday. And then um, during the puja or after the puja, um, this Vedic astrologer was like, I really need to do your reading so that we can, you know, um, just like map out what's going on for you and everything. I was like, cool. So I go to his little hut and I sit there and mostly it was, there was some gibberish and there was some things that I could, you know, understand, 
you know, in terms of what was coming through his English. And then he ultimately said, he gave me a list of numbers and he gave me a couple things that he wanted me to do and a couple asanas and whatever he wanted me to focus on. And then he was like, um, you're supposed to mother the mother. And I was like, what? And I said, well, I'm doing that. I have this company and whatever. He's like, no, no, no. You're supposed to really mother the mother. It's like a next, it's like a next level thing. And I was like, okay, noted. So I was already thinking it has to be that he wants me to do doula. And so then, um, but I wasn't like fully, I was like, it must be that, but I'm not sure. But I was like, but it feels like that. And then long story short, I get home. I had written down all the numbers that he gave me. I had like, I still have a piece of paper, just like checking it. And then I got back into my life and I kind of still had it in the back of my head. Like, you know, any signals of anything interesting that would pop up that would make me, you know, make the correlation. I got home and one of the days, one of the numbers was like, it was like 9, 15 was one of the days. And so I remember um, checking my email, which at the time people didn't check their emails every single day. It wasn't like now where it's on your phone. There was no emails on phones back then. And so um, I remember I had checked my email. I'd woken up early and I heard like the little ding, you know, when the emails are downloading. And it came up and it said, uh, there was something that said, like something about doula fellowship, you've been accepted. And I was like, what? And I opened that and I don't even really remember applying for this fellowship. Like, I think that I saw it and it was actually when, it, when I went back to like look to see the chain of events, I had applied, I had responded to one of those mass texts or mass emails which I never opened. So somehow I opened that, got this information, somehow mass group email, whatever, ends up in my inbox. And I respond and fill out this, by the way, it was not easy to fill out. I had to print it, I filled it out, I had to fax it or whatever I did back, and uh, or scan it or whatever you do back then. And I believe I faxed it. And then I get this email of acceptance and I was like, I don't really even remember filling this shit out. So I was like in trance when I did it. And so um, I knew in the moment when I read that, that I was supposed to be yeah. taking the doula route. And then I was already, I was obviously accepted to this program. And so then that's where my education started around the process even more deeply. But I say all that to say, like resistance is futile. It's like when you, when you are meant for a certain path and this happens along the hero's journey. And when we look at, um, you know, Wonder Woman, for instance, which a lot of people have seen. And it was a really beautiful and high grossing film that shows us what the hero's journey can be. And when you see this heroine who's on this path of discovery, she's also discovering who she is and what she's meant to do and doesn't even know her powers. And so I believe like in a similar way, like each of us is here. And what we're meant to do is like kind of come home to ourselves and really come to know our powers in a deep way and as we move through life it's like all right as you're navigating stuff is going to come up and present opportunities for you to become deeply and intimately connected to those powers and actually use them and exert them in those moments of you know challenge or, or triumph and and as you get closer to what you're meant to do there's all of these little things along the way like all these basically earth angels and fairies and you know guides and you know spirit that like and ancestors that lift you and push you and propel you and put things in your way or in your line of vision or like wake you up to tell you or whisper you know or you're on a massage table and somebody says something and you're like whoa like they through whatever vehicle possible make clear to you where you're supposed to head and so the listening is so important and i believe that um you know that was the biggest lesson for me was to listen you know as a taurus who's stubborn and all that like i could have continued to be like oh no 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 right yeah. but i heard the call i answered the call and that is what we're meant to do we're meant to answer these calls and we're meant to show up and we're meant to um even if it's uncomfortable or the timing is right or timing is wrong and we have other things going on in our life and it's like, how can I do this? It's like, 
you know, the universe rewards courage. So if you move in the direction of what's uncomfortable, then everything shows up to support you. It really does. And it's not meant to be easy. Like everything, we have to get over this idea of things being easy. They're not going to be easy. They're not meant to be easy. Like we're meant to like grow just like this plants that are coming up through the concrete. It's not easy to grow in that environment of yeah. you only have freaking concrete. You don't have any soil, you know, you're not getting water except for when it rains, it's hot. It's like, that is not an easy life, but it's, it's a life worth living because you are potent and powerful. And, um, and, and we don't necessarily get to choose how we came here. Like we don't get to choose whether or not we came through concrete but we get to choose what we do when we come to the surface. Like when we're here, we really do get to choose how we operate and what we do with our lives. So, so I think like, you know, that deep listening and answering to the call is so important. Yeah. You're so articulate, which makes me so excited for your next book. So tell me about Own Your Glow and Mm. what the process of writing it was for you. Well, Own Your Glow, um, is so beautiful. It's just like this, I call it an elixir for change. Mm, I, I call it a, um, you know, a, it's like a reminder. It's like I'm holding women's hands as they take this journey to come to know themselves in a deeper way. It's about self care as a pathway to empowerment and really listening to our deepest desires and owning the deepest recesses of ourselves, like the dark areas, the dark matter, like the things that we don't want to hold on to and embracing it and pulling all of that into the fold and returning to ourselves. And so um, for me, On Your Glow is a, it's like an awakening for women. It's mm-hmm. for us to, you know, like stand up and put our shoulders back and put and our crowns true. back on, you know, and put your crown and, and fix your crown and and be your most powerful and walk through the world through that lens of like, nobody can tell me anything. I am here. I am powerful. I am radiant. I can do it. And if we move through that space of, you know, a feminine um, power of, of embracing our unique feminine attributes and not try to be, you know, competing against men, but there's no competition because we can do so much. And so looking at how systems exist that don't support us and how we can change those systems or looking into how we can change ourselves so that we can better operate and realize like, you know what, this over here doesn't work for me, I'm gonna go over here. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm in a position that I can change something systematically because I have that level of power, I want women to awaken to that so that they can have the courage to make those changes on a systemic level. So it is about rituals and self-care and reflection and movement and exercise and you know prayer and all these beautiful things but but what it's priming people for is to make change and to um and to stand in that power and to answer that calling to like be be connected enough to their bodies and to also know that their body mind and spirit have anything to do with each other and and use that to like propel them forward in the world so yeah. that they can make a difference not just in their lives but in others' lives. Oh, that's so exciting. Yay! I love that so much. You talked about, I feel like this book is so great to bring this to more people. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that earlier with Mama Glow and expansion there. And I wrote this in my notes to ask you too of, you know, I think the wellness industry itself can be exclusive to people and there's a lack of accessibility Mm -hmm. and diversity and I would love to just kind of have your take on that and how we can make you're already doing it obviously but what are some ways to have more inclusion when it comes to wellness yeah I think you're spot on with that I do think that there's an issue around what 
who's invited to the party, right? It's right. like, who's, who is this for? How is it accessible? You know, I think that um, one of the things that we have to frame for ourselves um, is wellness is for everyone. Like every, like each of us has to take charge of our own health. I think that we have a plethora of information available. So if somebody really wants to like be healthy and live a healthy life, if they have a smartphone, which I believe everyone pretty much does, they can search recipes. They can go on Instagram and follow people who are, you know, helping inspire them in that way. But outside of just like, you know, what you can do on your own, there are barriers in terms of like, you know, shopping at Whole Foods or, you know, getting lemon to go to a yoga class or whatever it is. There's like all these things that, that keep certain people from feeling like they belong. Like I know people who be like, I'm not gonna go to yoga because I don't feel comfortable. Like yoga's for everyone. Or, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable or I don't think I can afford anything at Whole Foods. Well, if you're buying organic produce, there just that and not buying like all the packaged foods like the prices are kind of comparable to everywhere else or you can go to farmer's market as well and you can go at the end of the day and get like you know the last picks where by people are doing like the deals like two for five and things like that and you can really you know um you can really get your produce on a regular and have it affordable um you know when i think about this idea of uh, inclusivity and and the idea also of um, you know health being um, like the disparities in health there's like a lot of disparities in health in, in certain communities and I know I come from the African American community and there are so many health disparities when we look at cancer, heart disease, diabetes um, you know particularly those ones it's like we see so much in our community more than others and there isn't necessarily a lack of information it or awareness it's just like a lack of action around you know changing certain lifestyle habits and then people will say like you know about whether they not they can afford something or you know just our lifestyles have created the dis-ease and so i think that um it's really important to have people who look like you yeah. so that you can feel like it's possible to like yeah. lose the weight or it's possible to do the yoga or it's possible to, you know, start meditating or it's about, like all these things. If you, if you feel like you're the only one and you know, it's not pot, you know, happening in your community, then you're less likely to go and seek it out. Right. If you go to your gym and they don't offer mindfulness, then you're just not going to probably do that. You're just going to probably lift weights or whatever. So I think we have to like stop thinking like, oh, this community won't do that or they don't, that, they, that's not for them. Or I remember for the longest, they wouldn't do a Whole Foods in Harlem, even though like everybody was going from 59th Street and bringing all these Whole Foods bags up to Harlem. And they would ask you your zip code because they're trying to figure out where they're going to build next. And they realized so many people were coming from uptown and they were like, well, like are the people in Harlem really going to buy Whole Foods? It's like dude like why are you assuming that people don't want to yeah. eat healthy it's like the whole foods coming to detroit it's, it's like people do want to eat healthy but like yes you have to make a commitment to having to hiring people in the neighborhood you have to make a commitment to like giving back to the community and supporting local business like there's all kinds of i think um things that we need to do to sort of equalize and also um and and open up the space so that everybody feels like they have a seat at the table because it's because it's not just like people shouldn't be like oh you know i'm suffering from this particular ailment because i can't be a part of the wellness movement right. you know and i think you know to be for people to think that like it's a luxury and not a necessity to to be well and live well and, and feel and we're talking not just about foods and movement we're talking about mental health we're talking about spiritual health we're talking about you know um access and and you know, food justice and food security, just as much as we're talking about just, you know, you know, being able to afford a pair of like lemon pants or whatever. Right. Right. So when we create like a culture that's obsessed with leggings and make that the focus, you know, instead of like, you know, um, making sure that kids in inner cities have access to, to mindfulness classes 
or that um, like Benton Learning is a great organization that's doing that and, and uh, Mindful is a wonderful company that's now um, opened a, um, an outpost that's just for children, just for students actually to, uh, to meditate. And so there's a lot of things that are happening in the, in the space, but I think that you know each of us has to be responsible for um, for making more room and also to to open up and, and let other people in other communities know that it's possible for them like that they also deserve it because um, yeah it does feel like I, I totally see that whole like elitist thing and you know um, like whether it's like a ten dollar juice or whether it's like a you know um, retreats or things that people just can't in their daily life do if they're worried about their rent Right. you know but there are tools that everybody has access to that are free and then most people who are you know lit, showing the glitziest sides of mindfulness or sorry the glitziest sides of wellness are doing these like basic things so, like they're yeah. putting their yoga mat on the floor at home and doing their practice and they might show you on Instagram that they're doing it on like a mountaintop somewhere but like in general they're yeah. probably just doing it in their home and these things, you know, at home, like YouTube on your phone, you can follow a yoga class or, you know, um, you can probably go to community classes in your neighborhood with young teachers, you know, that are trying to build their teaching um, expertise. There's lots of ways that you can get around like the affordability piece. Um, but I think that it takes also commitment and not just being like, oh, well, it's not for us or they don't have anything for us and then create something. Yeah. Also, I think I think like don't just say like there's nothing here. Then be like since there isn't anything here, then maybe you work to get it. Like I was right. on this um, group thread where um, someone saw an, um, a mindfulness um, festival that was set up for kids. Um, it was with Modern Ohm, which is a friend of mine who started that company, and somebody put me in a group uh, text on DM with the founder plus a whole bunch of people from Harlem and was like, we want to bring this to the kids. And then all of a sudden it became like this thing where everyone's chatting about how can we bring this to the kids? That's an app. That's, that's how we do that. Like yeah. you have to speak up and we have to say, we deserve this. We need this as well. Like look to see where things are happening that work and find a way to bring it in as well. I think we as community members have to be stewards of our own wellness and not expect somebody to hand it over to us. Right. It's a very, it's a highly personal thing. Um, but we also have to teach it. We have to like make sure that like our children move through life knowing that they matter. Their health and wellness is like, is their health is, is their currency. Like if you don't have health, like what do you have? And, um, and we see far too many children suffering as a result of we don't as a result of our um, you know deliberate like focus off of them and onto like you know elitism you yeah. know and consumerism where we don't need to like you can be well and not be participating in a capitalist you know focus on you know optimizing you know optimizing revenue growth because of the fact that people are having a moment with like whatever the new product right. is. I think the the biggest thing, I love that you touched on all that, but I think the biggest thing too is about seeing, and you mentioned this, seeing yourself reflected in the leadership and Totally. And I, you know, primarily it's like white, thin women, just like what's reflected in the media. Mm -hmm. And when you don't see yourself reflected, it's really challenging. And totally. so I think that's something too that should be mentioned is, is great about your work, you know? Oh my God, and, thank you. And I think it's really important that, you know, there's more, it inspires not only people to you utilize your work, but to be like, all right, I, I see can my do it too. Exactly. I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, I, you know, I was talking to a friend about this the other day and she's like, well, who else is really doing what you do? And I'm like, I mean, I don't see anyone, but I think that's because like we don't elevate people who are doing the work. Like we, we there's like a lens for who people want to elevate and who they want to give shine to and who they want to put on the cover of this or that. And I was like, so I think that like there's tons of people doing it. They just don't ever get accolades or they don't ever get acknowledgement. And it's not that we're doing it for acknowledgement, but you need to like show people like what's out there so they can know that, wait, okay, there are resources yeah. for us. And so, um, but yeah, I agree with you. I think like 
that's why I feel like it's so important, like what Oprah did with that list was to say, okay, here's a bunch of voices, yeah. you know, and, and I believe in them. And then that helps because every, every little bit of acknowledgement, every little bit of elevation helps because then people listen. And so if people are like, okay, I trust her, so I'm going to trust you, and they listen, yeah. and they're like, oh, maybe I can do this. And I see myself reflected I in see this myself person. reflected. Yeah. I see that this person cares about me and what and who I am and what I'm what what matters to me. Yeah. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask you the questions I ask everyone. So we'll just go through these kind of quickly Rabbit because they've virus. changed since since you've been on the show. Cool. So something that I'd really love to hear you speak about, which I think is so important right now and forever, is your definition of feminism mm -hmm. and how you define and act your feminism in your life. So, um, for me, feminism is um, an act, and I think I, I think my book is feminist um, or womanist. And I say that because, um, you know, I'm all about not trying to fit into the social and corporate constructs of what have been designed for men, but for us to examine how we are trying to fit into these pockets and what we're doing to ourselves in order to mold into fitting into these spaces and how that affects our existence, how that affects us on a soul level, how that affects our anatomy, how that affects our self-worth. And, um, and I think that for far too long, women have been pressured into being good men. Like we've been taught to work really hard, to hustle, to you know, produce, 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 and like all of these things, you know, stop showing your emotions, get back into, put your head back down to work, like all these things that have turned us into like these, you know, male mechanical robots. And so that we could be equal, quote unquote. I'm not trying to be equal. I'm not like this whole idea of equality. And when we think about equality on a, on a, um, on a level that I would say more in terms of rights, we talk about equal rights, cool. We talk about just like men and women being equal, we're not. Like we're complementary. Um, we have different anatomy, we have different, our, we work differently, our brains are completely different, our needs are completely different, what we're capable of, what we can and cannot do, completely different. And this idea of like, well, we can do it too, as a framework of, as a, a operating from a, we can do it too standpoint, it's reactive. And it's like, they're not like, well, we can do it too with us. They're like, they're setting the paradigm and they've set the paradigm. And instead of us saying, no, F this, we need to change things that work for us. Like if I'm gonna be in this corporate structure, I'm going to need to know that when I'm, you know, um, when I'm ready to have a family that I can bounce and come back and not be penalized and make less money because I wanted to have a baby and I'm not going to freeze my eggs. I'm going to have the child when I want to have the child and the company's going to support me and not set things up in a way that doesn't support you know, my having a family that values me as top level talent and that I want to come back. A company that also will have rooms for when I'm ready to breastfeed. Like there's got to be a, a way that we all come together and say, this isn't working for any of us. We're forced to behave a certain way so that we can get to the top. We're forced to like deny ourselves. So I believe being feminist is like, instead of trying to be, instead of forcing yourself in the mold of a good man, is to really embrace all your feminine attributes, bring that to the table, show up with all of that, all your super feminine superpowers, and use that to guide you, use that to leave your mark on the world. And rejecting the idea 
of having to do the things that men do. Like, we don't have to do that. We're capable of, like, other stuff and, like, way better at doing those things. We should be doing those things instead of saying, let's, like, totally forego our powers and, like, come over here and conform to this and leave all of that, like, powerful resource to, like, die or to be dormant. Why are we doing that? And so we're teaching our daughters this, and then we're wondering why we come up against health crises, why we have reproductive health issues, why we have anxiety, why we, like, mental health, you know, uh, things come up for us. We're wondering why we feel depression, or we're wondering why we feel, like, unfulfilled. And it's because we're leaving our most important assets, like, out, hanging it out to dry, and, and trying to be someone else, like, most of our lives. Mm. And that's sad. Because the most powerful women that you look at and you're like, oh my gosh, she's so amazing, look at her, look what she's doing, is probably depressed or probably sad or probably unfulfilled or probably not even realizing Aware. that she's even that, that she's even affected by all this yeah. stuff because she's so, you know, Product like in the system. Patriarchy. That's right. And so it's not about the downfall of this and screw that or whatever. It's really about like assessing Does this feel good, me being here? I don't, like, why am I the only woman in this room? Why are these things allowed to be said? What is this culture that we've allowed to, like, take root so that people in these companies can treat us like this? What is it that we need as women to succeed in a a workplace? What does it feel like for us? What are our necessities? Because the problem is, this, like, oh, if I talk about this then, you know, it's like everything is about I don't want to be seen as weak or I don't want to be seen as this or whatever these things are. Vulnerable. Vulnerability is a key to our power. So you cannot be powerful if you're not vulnerable. And you can't be vulnerable without being powerful. Like, there's power in vulnerability. So if you are, if you're hiding that and stifling the vulnerability to, pre- to present as powerful, then you're, then you're weak. So I see fem- feminism, like what it's supposed to be in terms of what it delivers to us and how it shows up for us and how it operates, is to not make every place equal, to make every place, because you're not going to create circumstances for women to thrive if you're trying to make them equal to what men have. That is not what's going to make us thrive. We need to set up systems, networks, support, uh, um, you know, companies, HR departments, like all these different things, you know, resources that reflect a model of partnership, support, mentorship, sponsorship, um, you know, uh, um, nurturing cultivation like these kinds of very feminine ideas for how to create and how to interact versus a linear system that's headed this direction and if you fall out for whatever reason then everybody's like we can't have it like that we have to look at like how can we create something that's dynamic, that supports all of us, that doesn't pit us against each other? Because the way it's set up, women are pit against each other to succeed. It is not our nature to be fighting each other. So all of this stuff, if like if we're really talking about real, true feminism, it is not being also upset at or alienating men. It's about bringing men as allies in to also speak at the table, it's like looking at those people who are at the table and being like, if I can't get my foot in the door, I'm gonna make sure that you know what it is that we need so you can advocate for it when you're on the other side of that door at that Mm -hmm. table. We need to be thinking like that. Not make, the men are not the enemy. They have to become the ally. They have to understand what it takes to support women and what it takes for us to thrive. And if we focus too much about us and and ourselves and not like making sure we educate them so that they can also advocate for us and be part of this power shift, then we're going to be 
like we're gonna stay like this we're gonna stay in this situation whereby we think we're making steps forward when we're making teeny steps back and I'm not saying that there hasn't been a huge like I'm thankful for what the feminist movement has done but in terms of like a um, in terms of an understanding culturally of what the movement is there's a lack of understanding yeah. how can you have a movement that's so misunderstood by everyone right if after so many years yeah. like that we have we have to do that work we have to be the ones that stand up and say and not talk, not preach to the choir but go outside the church doors and be grounding people up and also understand well, what's your community like me well, what do you need what is it that you need and stop making it also again like you talked about you know seeing people you know that look like you in positions of power or see people like you in the wellness movement and not being exclusive over here too in feminism we have to like raise up younger voices we have to raise up and cultivate people you know in their in their speak around these issues we also have to lift people in their pain and come to an understanding of I'm gonna fight for you because I know you can't go in a room and speak for yourself I have to be the one to say it I have to be the one to say you know this or that or this person has to say black lives matter I can't go in and say that because then it's gonna it's gonna not come off if somebody else goes in and is like, you know what, we got to look at this community too, or we got to look at that community too, or they're having this issue, we got to put that on, like, let's add that in. Like, make it about all of us, yeah. right? And so, and I think that that's a big thing around, um, you know, like um, intersectionalism and feminism, but it shouldn't have to be that there's like another little area that now has to be addressed because not everyone's needs are being addressed in the overall arc, right? So, so I think that um, that is my that is what I think feminism is all about. I know it was too long, but I it's believe that like it's beautiful. <laughs> but I believe that it's about us, you know, really in, like owning our glow. And yeah. I think when you own your glow, you are the most powerful version of a feminist. Yes. You know, mic drop. That was so beautiful. <gasps> that was the like most beautiful definition of feminism I've ever heard in my life, and it reminded me. This is slight detour but it reminded me of my favorite lesson that I've ever gotten from you which mm. is about balance being a myth mm. and I think we maybe talked about it in the other episode yeah. or I heard you talk about it somewhere else but and you can like quickly say what you mean they're probably yeah. better than I can articulate it but it's kind of the same thing with feminism it's not about like finding feminism it's about restructuring and making yes. it work same how you speak yes. about balance Yes, I love that. Yes, I mean, I love how you said it in like two minutes. I had to say it in like ten. No. But um, yeah, the same thing with balance. It's like, why are we striving towards that? Why are we, what's this idea of everything being perfect, everything being done? Like, it's, it never is. Like, as long as you're breathing, thank God, there will be shit to do. And there will be still stuff on the table and dishes ain't washed or whatever it is. But we have to reprioritize what it is that we need to feel like we're, um, like we're glowing, glowing, but also um, when we think about balance, what people don't understand is balance is never stillness. Balance is always moving. So when you think about a tightrope walker who's walking across a tightrope, what keeps them on that tightrope is what a pole. Yeah. And what keeps that what what is a pole's actual purpose is to throw them off balance. The the pole is. They do this the whole time, right? They're like, you know, they're moving back and forth for people who are listening, not watching me do this motion. Yeah. <laughs> they sort of like move back and forth, side to side in all different directions right. as they walk across. And the only thing that's steady is the feet. The, the arms are moving, the rope is tight, but that's what's getting you across is being thrown off balance. So we think about what life throws us. It's not for us to be like, okay, kumbaya, I'm just going to sit here and like, you know, just dream my way there. No, it's like these things come and you deal with them as they come and you figure it out as it's happening. And that's a blessing to be able to respond to things as they show up and have the ability to keep on the tightrope. And um, so I think, yeah, I think it's about that. I don't think it's about striving towards balance. I love that. 
Okay, we'll make these ones Short. a bit quicker. Yeah. yeah. I'll the the first ones are easier and then they get slightly harder. So okay. here's a warning. Okay, favorite color? Pink. Favorite day of the week? Friday. Favorite hour of the day? Ooh, favorite hour of the day. Mm. Like 6 a.m. One thing you wish more people knew about you? Ooh, this is a good one. Um, I wish people knew that I can be silly. Okay. Um, that I am really good at untying knots. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. That's good to know. I'll yeah. come over if I Right? It's like when you get these things finish. tangled, I'm really good at untying them. That's a really good skill to yeah. have, actually. Okay, best thing you've eaten in the last week? Oh, very easy to answer. <sighs> um, I went to this place. It's called um, Ha Ha Ha. I love it there. It's so good. I just went with my, when my boyfriend was in town. It's, it's amazing. my favorite. Yes. So good. We should go. Yes, we have to go. It's Vegan, so good. Mexican. What did you get? I got the nachos. Okay, I, we didn't get the nachos. Oh, we I saw someone, and then we were like, we ordered them properly. The nachos are Did meal. you have the tacos, though? Okay, I've you had, had tacos there, because I've gone a few times, but they have these pupusas. <gasps> it's a meal. Wait, is that the... Wait, what, what is that? The pupusas are like this little kind of like flat, open-faced taco, oh, I didn't get that. but on the inside is beans, and they're yeah. like that thick. And then on the top is like toppings, like lettuce yeah, and salsa. Yeah, yeah. So good. We did the all three tacos and the empanada and then the oh, salad. Oh, the empanada is good. The salads were really good too. Yeah. Everything was good. I love that. We both love that place. That place is okay. good. Okay. Greatest lesson on relationships. Greatest lesson on relationships? Um, hmm. Well, maybe there's two. One, when I broke up with my son's father and... The lesson in letting go of that and being prepared to be on my own and being prepared to uh, grow because I felt like a little pot that was being stifled in that relationship or a little plant inside of one of those pots that you've outgrown yeah. and um, being stifled. I had to learn to step into my power. I had to learn to step into what was next for me. Was that scary making that choice? Oh yeah, yeah, it was scary. Um, I knew that it was supposed to happen. I didn't know when it was going to happen. I knew it was, I knew I had to make that step before you made it. You yes, for a while, terrified, and and I did it. And I don't know if I look back, I would never have become if I didn't do that. So I think that um, you know our lives are about becoming, and you do have to you do have to sometimes take a leap. And I did have to do that in that regard um the other lesson would be like um, my fiance having cancer and uh sort of you know just the the challenge of being in a in a relationship with somebody who is facing death as like they're like that was just on the table all the time and um and also dealing with how he handles things, which is to not tell people and to not, you know, get support. And he only depended upon me. And I remember the weight of carrying someone as well as not having an outlet because he didn't want anyone to know. Um, if, I, if it happened again, I would definitely not handle it that way. And I told him, like, I could never handle it that way and um, in the future. So it was like a lesson in, um, you know... In, in in claiming my space and boundaries and self-care around being a caretaker. Mm. So those yeah. are my two. Greatest lesson on motherhood. <sighs> Greatest lesson in motherhood. I think to... Um, I think to, to listen, to, to observe... Um, you know, I always watch my son and listen to him, talk to him, communicate. And I think the best thing that we can do is communicate with our kids. Um, and then also I believe that my journey as a mother has really informed my work as a doula and vice versa. And so I would just say that, um, the doula practice has 
really bled into my mothering because I watch and see. Like I, I approach motherhood in the same way and just sort of watching and handholding. Um, so I think just being a mom, like you're not necessarily aware of what you have to learn, but your child presents it to you. So yeah. it's like almost like every day is a great lesson. Mm. Greatest lesson on spirituality, where you are with that, what you think happens when we die, everything there. Hmm. I think that um, the same thing that happens upon birth, like there, there's an awareness that you're on your way someplace and you move from darkness into light. I think death is like that. You move from light into, into darkness and into light. And um, I think that, uh, I know that there is a, spiritual and chemical process that takes us there and um you know your body has its own internal pharmacy and so um at heightened points in life like um you know at at orgasm at birth and at death there is a common um uh, chemical that's in the bloodstream called um, dmt and it's in copious amounts at those different portals and oh, yeah. i know that at birth, it's peak amounts for both mother and baby who are experiencing, like, um, hopefully a, uh, a trance. And at death, when, whether it's something that you know is coming or not, that um, at that moment, too, what floods through your body so that you can transition, um, I, I feel like if birth is the way it is, that death has to also be something like that, but the but the inverse or the opposite or something. So I don't know how we leave, but I've talked to people, including my sister, who had um, a near death experience, and, and everybody describes like the same thing. So I know it must be beautiful. Um, you know, when I think about spirit, you know, my my relationship is just one like. You know, just talk to God like I'm talking to my girlfriend. I'm just like, Lord Jesus, please, like, just... I know you don't answer prayers like this, but could you, you know, like, make sure that this happens this way today? Because I'm tired. I need a nap. And, like, can you... You know, whatever it is, I just talk to God, like, you know, like I'm talking to my girlfriends. And I, um, you know, I grew up in a family. Like, my grandmother is a Eucharistic minister, Catholic church. My father was in a Baptist and African American Episcopal Church, AME. And so I saw like the more kind of constrained, you know, Catholic, very, you know, uptight, traditional vibe. And then I've seen people like praising and having, you know, beautiful music ministry. And I felt really like a, an affinity for that. And although I feel comfortable in any setting, in any space, you know, I've gone to Sufi Laylas where, you know, we're chanting, you know, in in Arabic um, and dancing until six in the morning, listening to, you know, Sufi mystics, or I've gone to Zikrs, or I've gone to Masjid, or I've gone to, you know, um, Buddhist temples. Like I've gone everywhere to worship. And um, because I believe that everybody's saying the same thing and that, um, and that if you go into a holy place, that everybody who's come there has come to do what you've done or what you're doing there. And so it's charged with a certain energy. And so I love going into spiritual spaces, but I believe that um, every space is spiritual, that you make it so. And so if you want like your home to be a place where people feel safe, then you imbue it with that energy. And that's why I believe in creating sacred spaces and altars and things that can draw us into a moment of feeling ourselves you know so um so for me spirituality is like you know um not something you separate from like here's my life and then this little compartment of it it's like your lens for living your life is yeah. through spirituality and so it's when you walk down the street not with your head down on your phone but like looking because there's a beautiful butterfly and then seeing that there's flowers in bloom and then looking at like you know going on the high line instead of the street it's like all these things of like un, you know beauty beauty and nature too which for me is a big a big piece of of, of what i love and, and what i celebrate in spirit yeah. also is is what we have in terms of this beautiful ambient landscape i love that okay this is one of my questions that i've had since the beginning so i've probably asked you but it's probably changed 
what are your morning routines? So like the first three things you do when you wake up in the morning and how that affects how the rest of your day goes. I wake up in the morning, I give thanks, I um, meditate and move. I do like a movement meditation on the floor or on the bed, depending. And then, um, yeah, then after that, like, I spend a little bit of time figuring out how I want the day to flow. Um, you know, start my morning routine of taking care of myself, getting ready, beautifying, all of that. And then, um, you know, I start to figure out, like, how I want to be perceived through whatever I wear. And um, I get that together. And then everything else is normal after that. It's like getting the breakfast together, whatever. But I don't start anything without like taking a moment to just ground myself in a new day and be and then be grateful for the new day. I think that no matter what is going on, um, you know, if I have something I'm stressed about or whatever is going on, I take that opportunity in the morning. Like, you know, I try to ask a question at night. In the morning, wake up. And sometimes there's solutions, or sometimes something else is up in the tip of my brain, and I try to write stuff stuff down um, that has come up for me, like right as I'm, you know, sitting in my sitting practice. Um, and another thing that I do too is just like um, use my voice. You know, Taurus is rule the throat, and, and so for us, it's like our voices are the first. It's like the first sign of anything. If you're gonna get sick, you feel it here. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak up for yourself, you feel it here. You know, so my. I think part of my journey in life is to tell the truth and to use my voice to speak truth. And, um, and when I'm not as aligned with like what I'm supposed to be uh, sharing, I can notice like congestion in my throat and stuff. So I always check in with my body um, first thing in the morning just to make sure that I'm always, you know, on point. I admire your style so much. Can you give like a couple? God, I'm like not even dressed today. But you look beautiful, especially with the couch. Oh my um, god, it's so funny. You're like camouflaged right now. I know, right? This so <laughs> totally matches. That's so I crazy. Love it. So what style rituals do you have or advice do you have? Like has your style grown as you've, you know, grown up? Like what so advice would you question. give someone? Um so funny because I have a whole section on this in the new book as oh, well. Perfect. Which is so great. Um so for me style is about um, you know, so so much about who you are personally. And um, I write about this thing called, um, there's a science, a branch of science called um, enclosed cognition. And uh, what it is, is it means that what you put on uh, creates, you know, the mood that you feel, but also the perception of what people have of you. And so, um, or effects, I should say. And so um, what we put on, whether it's sweatpants for the day, or like a beautiful dress and a hat or whatever it is, affects how we feel, like our level totally. of confidence and our level and how we perform. And so I feel like when I dress, not only do people respond, but also I feel confident when I'm wearing something that feels good for me, right? So I like to dress and wear things that make me feel comfortable, but also make me feel confident, make me feel powerful. I like bold colors, I like pattern, um, and I like to speak through uh, fashion and, and personal style. And, um, and so I have found that, um, you know, one of the exercises that I do, and I, I shared this in a book, there's a really powerful exercise on um, cloaking the goddess, and it's about essentially finding what are the powerful pieces in your wardrobe that allow you to evoke it, the energy of a particular archetype or a particular energy that you want to carry out to the world. And so, um, so I do that. Like I'll, um, but I definitely think that my personal style has evolved or, or grown or I don't know, over the years. Um, I've definitely put more focus on it since my child got to an age where he wasn't like eating in my lap and you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, then it was easier to like, you know, dress in heels and things like that when I wasn't like chasing behind a toddler. Um, but as you know, where I am now with with the level of um, movement I have it with Mama Glow, I'm always trying to keep it funky and fashionable, but also practical for like the things I have to do. Like if I have to go to a birth, it's like a jumpsuit's great or, you know, a pair of sweats is great for a birth but i'm not going to go to work in sweats you know right. so i do have rules 
around um, making sure that I feel good. And one of them is, you know, unless you're like, you know, a gazillionaire, you can't show up to work in sweatpants, you know? So as long as you're still like growing the business, you got to (laughs) dress. So that's how I feel. Like I want to make sure. And I also want to set that example for people who work with us that, you know, if I'm going to go acquire a new client or work with a new company or, you know, even meet, you know, new people who are working with us, they need to know how they have to dress too. And they need to know that I respect and I dress a certain way to also show the example. Yeah. Or to uphold the example. This is tied to that. I'm something I always ask because of my story with body image and my body. So Mm -hmm. how do you handle that? Like if you're having a bad body image day, how do you shift out of that and remind yourself to get back to feeling okay with yourself? Yeah, you know, um, I was very fortunate to grow up in a household with a mom who was always walking around naked and who, um, and so when we were kids, we just like throw off our clothes as we got home from school um, and who never like called attention to my parts. So um, she would always say like if I was, you know, oh yeah, such fast legs because I was run, running track and things like that. But she never, like there were certain things she never did. Like she never said, I remember when um, I went to one of my track meets and I had, you know, little like fuzz growing under my arms because like, my first like underarm hair and these girls like made fun of me and I was like, what? There's like almost nothing there. And they were like, oh my God, that's so disgusting. And I told my mom and I was like, well, what's wrong? And she was like, it's okay. Like, you don't have to shave, you know, you don't have to shave yet, but like there's hardly anything there. Don't, don't bother, don't matter. Like we're mind what they say. My mom also encouraged me not to ever shave my legs, which I've never shaved my legs. And so there's been, you know, things like that where, um, I, I listened to her and I look to her as like the conduit for like, or just more like the bar- the barometer for like safety. Like, am I okay in my skin, right? And so, um, as a child, and then I think that um, as I grew older, because I'm coming from a community that is largely looking at if you're thin, you're like unhealthy, and if you're thicker, you're considered healthy. So I'm coming when I come like to like not home like my grandparents and my mother are because they're thin but like when we go to like Virginia and we see like our relatives and stuff like um you know kind of like her family reunion type of thing and they think I'm skinny or they'll say things like that and I'm like I'm actually healthy I'm normal like I'm not skinny I'm just I'm healthy and they're like no 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 you're not healthy and they think that someone who's you know, what I would consider to be overweight, you know, or like maybe not necessarily personally, but just in terms of if you go to the doctor, they would probably say you're overweight is considered healthy. So there's a really skewed way of how different communities view, you know, weight and body appearance. And so the one time that I felt very insecure about my shape was um, when I just had my son and I actually lost so much weight after that I was under my pre-pregnancy weight so I didn't fit me in my clothes I looked really skinny I looked really I considered unhealthy at that point and but but then I had friends like my white friends were like oh my god you look so amazing and then like my black friends were like girl you don't have a booty anymore it was like so weird to be so you know like embraced over here and then like you know ostracized over here and like not feel comfortable in myself and so there's a one time I remember being in, in my neighborhood and like guys would not even say anything. They thought I was like a little kid because I just didn't look um, womanly. Like, I mean, I had boobs, but I didn't like I didn't have any curves. Right. And so I remember like, OK, I'm going to do squats. I'm going to work out. And I started to, to, to put a little bit more weight back on and got healthier um, or what was considered healthier after my son was maybe like three years old, like I started, my weight started to come back up. But um, I remember feeling like, wow, this is a very interesting place to be because it's like where a lot of people wish that that happened to them. And then I just couldn't reconcile where I fit in terms of, you know, like in, in, in my life, like in yeah. places, like I looked great in a dress, but I didn't feel, I was like, well, whose body is this? So it was really yeah. interesting to have that experience and not feel at home in my body in the same way. Um, I, I felt like 
I didn't feel not beautiful. I just didn't understand. I had never had that type of shape right. in, until and since I was like preteen, right. basically. Right. Um, the boobs were also new, and I didn't feel comfortable with those because I was so I was an athlete, so I was always used to having like a very small chest, and so I felt uncomfortable with the boobs. So it was like a, it was just like this this getting yeah. used to your body, which was very interesting. And so I would say that um, to turn that around for me, it was like becoming you know active in terms of like I had a trainer who came to see us and we would work out with him and he helped me with that and then I also had um you know with my wardrobe I was really saying well if I'm gonna have this and these dresses that have boobage that I could Mm -hmm. fill in I'm gonna wear these dresses and so then I started to do more like you know high fashion because a lot of the samples were or even like not, I was smaller than a lot of the samples, but I could fill in the chest. And yeah. so, like, I would try to then celebrate, like, the body that I had, you know, for the time. And then I got more comfortable as I went on. But I also remember feeling, um, you know, made fun of by people who, or, like, people were, like, ugh, upset that, like, they were trying to lose weight and I was having trouble keeping weight on. Right. And so it was, like, I wasn't in break. So it was a really weird place to be. Because it's one thing if you're trying to lose weight and you have weight to lose, and it's another thing if you don't have any weight to lose and you're and then you're really thin and then people are like trying to get there in their own lives and they're looking at you and making you feel bad because this just happened to you because it's just like it's your genes, like that didn't feel good. And so I think that there's a very interesting thing with body shaming and body imaging where we make like we've created a culture where women are examining themselves each other over examining looking at their thighs versus your thigh it's like you know measuring the circumference of their thighs by like eyeballing and then feeling like not good enough to be in their own skin and um and we don't just shame one way people think it's just like the people are getting fat shamed um people get skinny shamed all the time people who are thin get shamed by people who are um, you know, heavier as if they're, you know, like, oh, skinny girls can't do this and skinny girls, like, there's all this kind of dialogue and it's like, why are you even saying that when people would put you in the category and make fun of you, why would you like, that's not empowering yourself as a bigger woman to, like, then take down women who are naturally thin or who happen to be thin it's not their fault or whatever and so it's like, you know we have to stop doing that, like, looking at the other one and finding fault, like, oh they're, they don't have any self-control that's why they're too big Yes. You don't eat. That's why you're too skinny. It's like, stop. Like, why don't we just let people yeah. be in their skin? Totally. And I think that that's what we need to see as part of, I think, the job of one of the things that we need to put on the agenda for feminism yeah. is we need to come together and embrace that there is an entire continuum of women of different sizes and shapes and colors, and they yes. all deserve to be. Yes. And they yes. all are worthy. Yes. Oh, okay, so many good things. I had like 10 more questions I want to ask you, but I don't want to keep you any longer. We'll do this again next book. Yay! So the name of the podcast has changed from The Wellness Wonderland to what it is now, Let It Out. Mm-hmm. So when I offer that to you to let it out, mm. what comes up? Anything you wish I would have asked you? Did I wring you dry for all of your Latham wisdom? <laughs> I thought you got really good stuff. You know, Let It Out, I think um, I just want to let out praise and gratitude and just thank you and I want to also thank everyone who's been helpful to me in this process I know I reached out to you and was like hey I don't know if you knew I'm having this book coming out and and you were like oh my god hi and I was like you know because I know that you came to New York and I know I hadn't seen you yet and you know when you first interviewed me I had, like, nothing to market and nothing, like, I was just like, okay, like, yeah, sure, like, why should you want to interview me? And I was happy to do it, but also there was nothing, like, I know the book was, I, I think Mama Glow was out, or I don't know. I'm trying to remember if it had, it had to come out yet. Because it came out in 2012. Or it just come out. It just come out, okay. Or it was, like, too far away to be promoting yeah, it. Yeah, so it wasn't, yeah, it, it, it wasn't come anything out. to promote. Yeah. yeah, so there was nothing to promote. And I was very clearly, like, not a mother. I was 22 it years was old awesome. and I hadn't even, like, but I just connected with you so much. But it was awesome because you were really, I think, catching on to what I am moving into now, which is, you know, if people are on the Instagram where I'm, you know, at Glow Maven, I'm 
also speaking to everybody. I'm not just speaking to moms. I really want women to know that this book is not about pregnancy. This second book is really about women giving rise to the best iteration yeah. of themselves. And you can, wherever you are in life, it's available to you. And, and again, I wanted to say thank you because the support and the uplift that I feel from this experience has been so incredible. The people who have showed up or who have said yes or who have asked me if they could do whatever it is to lift me, I wasn't expecting it because I think sometimes you just don't think, like you hope that people want to and then when they do, you're like, oh, wow. So I just want to say that I just feel so blessed. I just want to let it out that, you know, when you do the work and when you feel like when you also pay it forward and help others, that people will show up for you. And um, and it's not always who you expect, but people will show up. And so I'm just grateful like that you're sitting in my living room <laughs> on a Saturday when you could be doing any other thing and it's cloudy out and you're here. And um, so thank you for that. All right, that was the episode with Latham. Isn't she great? I think Latham is wonderful. And if you do too, tweet at her, tweet at me. Let me know. I'm recording this very late at night. I'm a little bit weary, but I'm going on a trip, so I'm trying to get everything in, and, you know, there's just a lot of things to get in. Next week on the podcast, it's going to be a surprise. And I honestly would tell you, I'm just not sure who it's going to be right now. I'm so sorry. If I knew for sure, I would tell you, but I have so many good episodes coming up. I love the way this one turned out and I'm excited for you to hear all the rest of them and I love you guys have a great time wherever you're listening and one more shout out to freshbooks.com they are the easy to use online cloud accounting software that I love you can build clients you they take credit card payments if you're not an entrepreneur and just want to stay on top of your finances you might as well use them because you can get a free unrestricted 30-day trial by using the code let it out at checkout so thank you so much for for sponsoring fresh books i love you and also thank you to franklin and whitman the best cruelty free skincare line my friend chris owns it they are based out of philadelphia they make everything in small batches they use superfoods as the first ingredient in every single one of their products everything is made with love everything's cruelty free they donate 5% of all of their sales to animal shelters. They're great. All right. Thank you so much, Chris and Franklin and Whitman. If you want to try them out, get 20% off your order by using the code Katie at checkout. That's not just your first order. Anytime you want to order, you can use the code Katie, K-A-T-I-E, and get 20% off. Thank you so much, Frank and Whit. Thank you, FreshBooks. Thank you for listening. And... The emoji for this week's episode is the star, because Latham Thomas is a star, you guys. That's what she is. She's shining real bright and real far, and she's not shy. She's a star, and so are you. I'll talk to you guys next week. Love you. Good night.